Chapter 3 The Future We Lost Rosa Luxemburg was already a distinguished theorist when she started teaching activists and trade unionists at the Social Democratic Party's SPD Berlin School. In one classroom photo from 1907, she's smiling and standing not far from where Friedrich Ebert, the future German president, sits. Another student of hers, Wilhelm Pieck, is in the same row, even closer. He also went on to be a German president. Ebert, a social democrat, helmed the pre-war Weimar Republic, Pieck, the communist post-war East German state. Each of their paths led to power. Rosa Luxemburg's led to the bottom of a canal. On January 15, 1919, the same day she was martyred, her comrade Karl Liebknecht was wheeled into a morgue riddled with gunshot wounds. Liebknecht's father was co-founder of the SPD, a party that Luxembourg had joined twenty years earlier. They both intimately knew the men blamed for their deaths, Friedrich Ebert and Gustav Noske. In 1891, all four of them had been at the pivotal Erfurt Congress, where they laid the groundwork for a generation of working-class politics. SPD leader August Babel spoke at the meeting with widely shared confidence. I am convinced that there are only a few people in this hall who will not experience the great day of socialism. As Luxembourg recounted, a warm, electric stream of life, of idealism, of security in joyful action swept through the delegates. In the years that followed, Europe's socialists had plenty of cause for optimism. In election after election, their parties saw vote totals climb as newly enfranchised workers turned out for them. It seemed natural, not least to terrified industrialists, that working-class political rights were translating into a shift in the balance of power. But the pressures that would ultimately kill many of the democratic revolutionaries corrupt those who survived and turn others into defenders of law and order were already emerging. The socialist movements of the 19th and early 20th centuries never ended up inheriting the world. Not just poorly led, they ran into a recurring problem of collective action. Though workers could only win gains through class struggle, they had more than their chains to lose in revolutionary politics. They relied on capital to survive and could not so easily break with the system that oppressed them and marched them off to war. Still, as we will discuss, the Second International Era gave birth to mass working-class parties that for the first time threatened to take state power from capitalists. The debates and political forms that emerged during this period have shaped the left ever since, as have questions about how the 20th century would have played out if these organizations had taken a different course. By the middle of the 19th century, Germany was undergoing a chaotic transformation into an industrial powerhouse. The country's Junka class of aristocratic landholders were paradoxically committed to breakneck modernization. The emerging capitalist class, for its part, didn't fully commit to the revolution of 1848, leaving political power mostly in the hands of the old elite and increasingly ceding the fight for democracy to workers. Like thousands of others, the future leader of German social democracy, August Bebel, went from trade union politics to socialism after reading the work of Ferdinand Lassalle. Lassalle was an unlikely founder of the General German Workers' Association, ADAV. At barely twenty years old, he had won fame defending the Countess Sophie von Hatzfeld in a protracted divorce. His first instinct was to challenge her husband to a duel— but after he was turned down, he pursued an eight-year legal battle fought in 36 different courtrooms. Ultimately, La Salle triumphed, winning the countess and himself a large fortune. Soon enough, he secured a more permanent place in history. After 1848, German workers began to see liberalism as inadequate to their interests, and La Salle took up their cause— 
at a time when veteran German socialists were in an uneasy alliance with the middle-class progressive party, LaSalle used his considerable talents to sway the movement in a different direction. In 1863, he helped found the ADAV, which adopted as its platform his sprawling treatise that argued for universal suffrage and state support for producer cooperatives. In pursuit of these demands, LaSalle attempted to forge an alliance with Otto von Bismarck, building on their shared opposition to liberalism. The bid for support failed, and the just 39-year-old LaSalle died in a duel soon after. Intellectually, LaSalle drew on Marxism but found fierce critics in Marx and Engels themselves, though the penniless Marx used to sometimes ask him for loans. He saw the state as autonomous rather than an instrument of class rule, and his belief in an iron law of wages, the idea that nothing could prevent wages from falling below subsistence levels, led him to downplay the possibilities for trade union victories within capitalism. More importantly, Marx and Engels rejected his bid for reform from above, instead advocating mass struggle to achieve change. Yet after La Salle's death, even his famous detractors had to concede that his efforts had woken up the German working class to a destiny distinct from liberalism. With its newly anointed leader suddenly dead, the future of the German workers' movement was uncertain— Babel eventually moved toward more conventional Marxist thought, and together with Wilhelm Liebknecht, a personal friend of Marx's, founded the Social Democratic Workers' Party, SDAP, in 1869. Unlike the ADAV, the party's program was clear, built on ten defined demands and six general principles that laid out the injustice of the present situation— the goal of working-class liberation from the wage-labor system in particular, and class society as a whole, and a commitment to political freedom and democracy. The seeds of what would become Second International Marxism were apparent in the SDAP program, but when the party merged with the ADAV six years later to form the 20,000-strong Socialist Workers' Party of Germany, SAP, the new organization's founding document had a distinct Lasallian flavor. It predictably drew the ire of Marx. The text claimed that labor is the source of all wealth and all culture. What about nature, Marx objected, and established a resolute principle of working-class independence. The emancipation of labor must be the work of the laboring class, opposed to which all other classes are only a reactionary body. The Gotha program, as the SAP's manifesto was called, sought the free state and the socialist society, the destruction of the iron law of wages, the overthrow of exploitation in all forms, and the abolition of all social and political inequality. In addition to his continued theoretical opposition to the Lasallian Iron Law of Wages thesis and the idea that even other oppressed classes were a reactionary body, Marx rightly questioned what this desired free state was. Only a decade had passed since Lasalle's failed overture to Bismarck, and he thought it vital for the SAP to have a clear view of the state. As he wrote in The German Ideology... 1846. The executive of the modern state is nothing but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. A party whose socialist ideas were more than skin deep would have to overcome that state and fight for a transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Marx did not spell out the implications in his critique of the Gotha program nor elsewhere in his writings, besides in his brief commentary on the Paris Commune. That omission, what form politics should take under socialism and how should the socialist state's institutions be structured, would be significant in the next century. At the time, however, Marx's polemics aside, the Socialist Workers' Party grew and evolved in the newly unified German nation. Bismarck now the German Empire's first chancellor, 
was well aware of the party's organizing efforts. He might have recalled his early meetings with LaSalle, and thus how willing some workers were to embrace statist reforms. He implemented a carrot-and-stick approach toward the restive workers' movement. The stick came first. The new SAP won 9% in the 1877 elections, a modest amount but a threefold increase over the total ADAV-SDAP vote in 1874. Soon arrived a pretext to clamp down on the party. Two attempts in 1878 on the Kaiser's life by presumed leftists. It was more than enough for Bismarck to convince the Reichstag to pass Sozialistengesetz, a series of acts banning social democratic agitation. The SAP could still stand for elections, but campaigning was effectively impossible. Party meetings were forbidden, newspapers were shuttered, and members sometimes arrested. Factory owners across the country made their workers sign vows that they were not social democrats. Then came the carrot, as Bismarck began to offer workers a kind of socialism from above, health insurance and social security schemes, believing that the real grievance of the worker is the insecurity of his existence. The social democrats weren't fooled, even by the regime's selective nationalizations. They realized that capitalism need not be laissez-faire, and pejoratively labeled Bismarck's plan state socialism. Voters, for their part, saw the situation quite rationally. The concessions were made because of the SAP's strength, which only served to vindicate it. Bismarck discovered that winning concessions often emboldens rather than placates the oppressed. The SAP continued to radicalize. At its first Congress in exile in 1880, it removed a Gotha program clause vowing to struggle only by legal means. Three years later, delegates went further and called their party a revolutionary one without parliamentary illusions and proud of its roots in the great master Marx. Social democracy was becoming a force beyond Germany as well. The Second International the successor to the International Working Men's Association of Marx's Day, was founded in Paris on Bastille Day, 1889, 100 years after the start of the French Revolution. The hall at Salpêtrel, chosen for the gathering, was draped in red cloth and filled with red flags. Above its presidium, in gold letters, read the parting exhortation of the Communist Manifesto, Workers of the World, Unite! The venue proved too small for the 400 delegates from 19 countries, and hasty preparations had to be made to host the rest of the proceedings elsewhere. Often with the Germans as their model, parties sprouted up across Europe claiming fealty to Marxism. It is easy then to conflate the triumph of Marxism, or even socialism more broadly, with the general rise of workers' movements— but objective and subjective factors were equally important. Socialists were able to credibly explain the injustices of the capitalist system, convince people that it could be done away with, and describe an agent with an interest in its overthrow. But they wouldn't have been able to do this without mass discontent amid rapid urbanization and industrialization, the process of creating a shared working-class identity and a politics to match it required brilliant feats of adaption and organizing. Throughout most of the 19th century, radical movements were dominated by non-Marxists, first utopian socialists who sought to build harmonious societies through creating a new man in communes, then intransigent anarchists who posed a maximalist opposition to both capitalist domination and the state itself, it was Marxist-influenced, scientific socialism that provided a more credible account of the difficult world workers found themselves in and a plausible way out. Parties across Europe met various roadblocks on the road to socialism. Most of the Second International, aside from the Russians, had more favorable conditions to organize in at home than did the Germans. At the Paris Congress, 
Babel warned his colleagues to burn papers before returning to Germany and look out for state agents in their midst. It was a reminder that their early success was not without its hardships, with party leaders in exile or under constant threat of arrest. They soon experienced some relief, as Bismarck's 1890 resignation coincided with the expiration of the anti-socialist laws. SAP campaigning was once again legal. By then, the newly renamed Social Democratic Party had amassed a considerable base of support. One in five German voters backed it in 1890. This didn't translate into political victories. Germany was intensely federalized, and different states had different suffrage laws. Where social democracy was strongest, such as in Prussia, representation was also less democratic, and conservative rural districts were heavily favored. Thus, though the largest party by popular vote, the SPD ended up with the fifth largest Reichstag contingent. With over 1.4 million votes, the party won only 35 seats, while the German Conservative Party received 73 from 895,100 votes. What's more, though it had a parliament, Germany remained a semi-autocratic monarchy. The emperor held sway in foreign policy and directly appointed a chancellor, who had great power over domestic affairs. And in the Reichstag itself, a conservative Juncker could win rousing applause after saying, The king of Prussia and German emperor must always be able to say to a lieutenant, Take ten men and shoot the Reichstag. That same representative would play a role making Hitler chancellor in 1933. Not surprisingly, the SPD tended to see German democracy as a sham. It still sought democratic victories, but for the most part the SPD adopted a stance of pure opposition. Elections were mostly measures of strength and for propaganda purposes. Even when the party won seats, legislative bodies were treated primarily as arenas to clarify class lines. Social Democratic legislators voted against state budgets. The movement had no interest in managing the capitalist state, only in organizing the working class, with an eye to a future period in power. The party's theory reflected its isolation. Its 1891 Erfurt program was a considerably more radical and Marxist document than the Gotha program, Written by Eduard Bernstein and Karl Kautsky, two theorists who would shape the SPD for years to come, the text portended the collapse of capitalism, describing an era of devastating crises and the ever more stark opposition between exploiters and the exploited. Private ownership, once the revolutionary force described in the Communist Manifesto, was now presented as a fetter on economic development. The solution proposed by Erfurt was the socialization of all private production. As Bernstein and Kautsky wrote, such a transformation amounts to the emancipation not only of the proletariat, but of the entire human race. The immediate tasks of the day were laid out in a section largely drafted by Bernstein. Without political rights, the working class cannot carry on its economic struggles and develop its economic organization. It cannot bring about the transfer of the means of production into the possession of the community without first having obtained political power. The Erfurt program also shifted away from Lasallian illiberalism to a declaration that the party fights not only the exploitation and oppression of wage earners in society today— but every manner of exploitation and oppression, whether directed against a class, party, sex, or race. The program concluded with a list of demands, ranging from proportional representation and universal suffrage to political freedoms and free medical care to the replacement of Germany's standing army with a militia. It also advocated workplace reform such as the eight-hour day, an end to child labor, and the prohibition of night work. There is an obvious gap between the radical, almost apocalyptic vision of capitalism in crisis 
and the comparatively modest immediate demands put forth by Bernstein and Kautsky. There was also a more subtle tension in the program between the urgency of the crisis described and the relatively passive role assigned to the working-class party. It is the task of the Social Democratic Party to shape the struggle of the working class into a conscious and unified one and to point out the inherent necessity of its goals. This is a concept of the party that Kautsky in particular would return to, one that prepares for but does not make revolution. But, for the time, the Erfurt program worked. Its marriage of maximalism and incrementalism proved practical for a broad party. All members of the SPD thought that reforms should be sought. The debate within the party was over how that should happen, class independence or alliances, rupture or compromise. All agreed, too, that the proletariat should look toward the socialist horizon. More than anyone else, Kautsky embodied the Erfurtian synthesis. The quintessential German Marxist was actually born in Prague and grew up in Vienna. Unlike the proletarian Babel, Kautsky was from a middle-class family that encouraged his interest in art, history, and philosophy. As a teenager, the 1871 Paris Commune stirred his imagination, but so did books like George Sand's The Sin of Monsieur Antoine, a mid-century work filled with romantic, radical sentiments. But the intellectual climate that Kautsky and others were born into was anything but idealist, this was an era of scientific advance, highly rationalist in its outlook. The young Kautsky studied Charles Darwin and biologist Ernst Haeckel. Marxism was not positivist, but it was able to draw in intellectuals with both its clear moral opposition to capitalist exploitation and its claim to know the laws of history and where it was headed. Kautsky joined the Social Democratic Party of Austria when he was 21, allying himself with the most radical, verging on anarchist wing of a fractious formation. Even then, he was more of an intellectual than an organizer, and in 1880 his work took him to Zurich, a city teeming with socialist exiles from across Germany and Russia. He met Eduard Bernstein there, Bernstein was just a few years older than Kautsky, and they quickly became of one heart and one soul. Together they studied Engels's anti During, a thorough rebuttal of the ethical, cross-class, as opposed to class-struggle-driven socialism promoted by Eugen During. The experience won them both over to Marxism. Through Bernstein and Babel, Kautsky started a correspondence with Engels and ventured to London in March 1881 to visit him and Marx for several months. Engels took to him, while Marx, nearing his final days, thought Kautsky a very talented drinker, but intellectually a mediocrity with a small-minded outlook. In sum, that made him a decent fellow in his own way. Throughout the 1880s, Kautsky would make trips to London, growing close with Engels. The friendship would endure until Engels' death in 1895, after which Kautsky was widely accepted as his heir. It was through Kautsky, not its two founders, that Marxism first captivated a mass audience. Kautsky was an industrious and intermittently brilliant theorist, but his success had much to do with timing. He founded the widely read socialist theoretical journal Die Neue Zeit in 1883. Coupled with his connection to Engels and the support of Babel, Kautsky became an authoritative voice within the SPD without ever having run for a party post. After the Second International was formed, and with his Erfurt program emulated by party after party, Kautsky was, without irony, considered the Pope of Marxism. During his day, socialism broke from its relative isolation and merged itself with a broader workers' movement. For the first time, they could be spoken of as one and the same. The fact that Kautsky was in Germany the epicenter of social democracy, was key to his prominence. 
The Social Democratic Party reached new heights every year, from 352,000 votes on its founding in 1874 to 1.4 million in 1890 to 3 million, nearly one-third of the electorate in 1903. Social Democratic workers weren't just voting for the party. They were enmeshed in its institutions and emotionally committed to its cause. Despite the working class's growing importance, it was isolated from mainstream German culture. The SPD wasn't just a party. It was an alternative culture where workers could educate themselves in a day school or through reading 75 affiliated papers, play in sports leagues or gymnastic clubs, and find friends and lovers at picnics and party taverns. This sense of collective belonging was cemented by lectures, rallies, and rituals. At times, Babel's rhetoric seemed to mimic the messianic appeal of Christianity. Christians knew that Christ would come again in his glory to judge the living and the dead. Social Democrats knew that every moment drew them closer to salvation on earth. But more concretely, Social Democracy's network of cooperative businesses and credit unions offered advancement to some workers, and for many others its clinics and other services filled gaps in the Bismarckian welfare state. For a party unable to deliver legislative victories, these material gains translated into legitimacy. More loftily, in theory, the state within the state was providing workers with the training and experience they would need when the great day finally came and they were to govern. In practice, it may be that these institutions fostered moderation and integrated workers into mainstream German society rather than offering an alternative to it. But those who already had power, not just in Germany but across Europe, looked nervously at the social democrats among them, growing more numerous by the day. There were those within the movement, however, who were beginning to question its foundation. This was perhaps to be expected. From the start, the modern left had been divided over countless questions, but in this case, its source was not. Eduard Bernstein, co-author of the party's Erfurt program, began to drift away from its orthodoxy in the mid-1890s. Though largely unschooled, Bernstein was supremely talented. Both Marx and Engels regarded him as the superior intellect to the younger Kautsky. After his short stint in Zurich, Bernstein spent over a decade living in London, engaging with another rising workers' movement, but one that had less time for Marxism. Bernstein arrived in England with impeccable Marxist credentials, but in the same British library where Marx had labored, he spent long days struggling to stretch his teachings, to bring them in accord with practical realities. The usually gregarious Bernstein distanced himself from friends and grew irritable, tormented by an intellectual dilemma. Capitalism was thriving and proving itself malleable, and he didn't foresee a collapse of the bourgeois economy in the near future. Not explicitly rejecting Marx, but instead using ambiguities in his thought to defend his new positions, Bernstein radically questioned orthodox Marxism. In a series of Neue Zeit articles, he posited that capitalism had morphed in a way Marx and Engels did not anticipate. For one, Society wasn't splitting up into two great hostile camps, bourgeoisie and proletariat, as the Communist Manifesto claimed and the Erfurt program echoed. Instead of disappearing, intermediary classes played a vital role in the modern economy. The 1891 program had also said that production was increasingly becoming the monopoly of a relatively small number of capitalists and large landowners— but as Bernstein pointed out, smaller firms were alive and well. As for workers, though they were certainly exploited and suffering, their material standing was slowly improving rather than deteriorating. 
Bernstein ventured furthest from his previous views when he insisted that capitalism had found ways to self-regulate and avoid crises, and that the working class had won the means, in the form of parliaments, to shape its development and slowly legislate reforms. His final broadside against the doom and gloom and revolutionary posturing of his party's mainstream was his proclamation that the ultimate aim of socialism is nothing, but the movement is everything. Though he was wrong about capitalism's ability to prevent crises, Bernstein perceived that though it was filled with internal contradictions, capitalism also had mechanisms for stabilization and adaption. There is a reason none of capitalism's many crises have proved terminal. More importantly, Bernstein offered a solution to tensions in the Erfurt program. The fault, Bernstein wrote, lies in the doctrine which assumes that progress depends on the deterioration of social conditions. The party claimed that capitalism was collapsing, but its immediate tasks seemed neither to hasten its demise nor to forestall it. Bernstein saw capitalism stabilizing itself, and he was glad for it, as it was in this environment that workers could win gains. His view that the ultimate aim of socialism is nothing didn't mean that he abandoned socialism, but rather that he saw the path to it as gradual rather than through revolution. Fittingly, the English-language collection of his work was titled Evolutionary Socialism. Bernstein's insistence that social democracy would reach new heights when it freed itself from obsolete phraseology and was willing to appear what it really is today, a democratic socialist reform party, foreshadowed post-war social democracy, when new opportunities appeared to manage the capitalist state in the interests of workers. In his own time, Bernstein's status as a leading Marxist intellectual meant the Neue Zeit articles caused worldwide controversy. Bernstein was right to question the teleology that ran through Second International Marxism. Borrowing from Kant, he believed that socialism was something that morally and ethically ought to be, not something that was necessarily destined to be. But Bernstein missed the fact that the confidence that history was on their side gave socialists strength. It also helped paper over differences between revolutionaries and reformists within social democratic parties. Kautsky at first hesitated in response to his friend. Not only was personal affection at play, but he seemed genuinely unsure what to make of the work. When its political implications became clear, however, the challenge couldn't be ignored. The future of the entire movement seemed to rest on their doctrinal dispute. When Kautsky entered the fray, he did so vigorously, both privately and publicly. Writing Bernstein directly, he complained that his Marxism had collapsed and that Bernstein was trying to become a representative of English socialism with his moderate turn. Engels had also once worried about Bernstein's affinity for Britain's moderate Fabian socialists, but dismissed it as a symptom of health troubles he was dealing with at the time. Bernstein, for his part, simply asserted that English capitalism was further along the same road as Germany and other industrial nations. At his most damning, Kautsky even said that his friend had ceased to be a social democrat at all and didn't have a place in the SPD. The theorist had already traded barbs with Bavarian reformist Georg von Vollmar, who went further than Bernstein and favored the SPD's transformation from a workers' party into a broader people's party. Kautsky responded that such a development would mean going from a party of the fighting proletariat into an eclectic swamp of frustrated fellows. But the most powerful riposte to Bernstein came from Rosa Luxemburg, who wrote a series of articles called Social Reform or Revolution. They represented the finest synthesis of Marxist orthodoxy yet written. Luxembourg argues that far from stabilizing capitalism, the growth of finance capital and industrial cartels would exacerbate the system's crises. The young, Polish-born radical 
didn't reject the daily fight for reforms or the importance of trade unions, seeing them as vital to building class consciousness. But she argued that a socialist society would emerge only after a decisive rupture with capitalism. She likened the struggles of those who tried to gradually bring about change within capitalism to the plight of Sisyphus. They make progress up the hill only to have to start again when their reforms are rolled back. In other words, without the structural leap to socialism, all that is won is the momentary suppression of the abuses of capitalism instead of suppression of capitalism itself. There was a difference in emphasis between Luxembourg's hammer blow of revolution and Kautsky's more passive role for the party, but for the moment the two thinkers were in accord. Kautsky would trumpet social reform or revolution and help bring more attention to Luxembourg's work. The larger distinction, after all, was between the radicals like them and the reformists, or revisionists as they were known, like Bernstein. Toward the end of 1898, the SPD officially intervened into the growing theoretical dispute at the party's Stuttgart Congress. Ultimately, the leadership joined the radicals and repudiated Bernstein, but the revisionists would eventually have their moment. The 1903 election witnessed the SPD extend its appeal for the first time to the middle class. The revisionists tried to use the occasion to force the party to take its parliamentary work more seriously by forming tactical coalitions with liberals to win reforms. The radicals beat them back at the Dresden Congress that year, however, buoyed by Kautsky's broadsides against the moderates, and again with the support of Babel and much of the party executive. In January 1905, SPD radicals found additional encouragement abroad. Russia's 1905 revolution showed the power of working-class mobilization. The Romanov dynasty, which had seemed unassailable, was almost driven from power. Labor militancy also rose within Germany, with strike activity increasing dramatically. The conditions, lockouts, increased employer organization, and cost-of-living increases that led to caution among trade union leaders fostered militancy in the rank and file. Debates within the SPD over the mass or general strike had gone on for several years, but the events of 1905 gave them more urgency. Instead of localized work stoppages at one plant or in one sector, mass strikes were political tools to force drastic concessions across industries. In the United States, the Philadelphia General Strike in 1835 called for wage increases and a 10-hour workday. Similar strikes occurred in 1877 in St. Louis and in 1892 in New Orleans. But the mass strikes debated in Germany were those by Belgian workers hoping to secure universal suffrage. Luxembourg thought the Belgians too timid tactically, and the revolution in Russia proved how far the general strike could go. While the revisionists saw a path to reform through the existing parliament and liberal coalitions, radicals, armed with this new weapon, could present a vision of democratizing the state through street action. In 1905, Kautsky was the voice of the radicals. His analysis of the 1905 revolution, in particular his warnings about the mendacity of Russian liberalism and his commentary on the radical potential of the empire's peasantry, was admired by Lenin and eventually proved prescient. It was his ally Luxembourg, however, who saw the Russian experience as replicable in Germany. When the revolution broke out, she traveled in disguise and took part in the movement in Poland, where she witnessed ordinary workers radicalize in the span of weeks. In her 1906 book, The Mass Strike, The Political Party and the Trade Unions, Luxembourg endorsed general strikes. But unlike anarchists, Luxembourg didn't equate the tactic with revolution. In contradistinction to the daily political struggle of the working class, but rather saw it as a tool to raise class consciousness and exert power. In 
Luxembourg reminded readers that economic and political struggles were inseparable. Rather than trade unions launching limited economic strikes for better conditions and wages, indefinite general strikes could win political ends, including suffrage and democratization. These gains wouldn't preclude parliamentary action, but rather turn parliament into a vehicle that could actually pass radical reforms. Unlike for Bernstein, the movement was not everything for Luxembourg. It had a distinct aim, the dictatorship of the proletariat, a task accomplished during a long period of gigantic social struggles. And unlike Babel, Luxembourg didn't see the mass strike as a one-off event directed by the party, but a grassroots form of struggle that couldn't be turned on and off by command. By breaking down the barriers between economic and political struggles, Luxembourg was attempting to stall the growing separation of the trade union movement and social democracy. Though in theory unions had no official power within the party, in practice, a theory of equal authority was gaining favor. Unions would use workplace strikes tactically, and the SPD would use Parliament to win political reforms— but with the path to reforms blocked by the anti-democratic Reichstag and many rank-and-file workers discontent with their economic situation, the need for a more radical approach was obvious to Luxembourg. Luxembourg's enthusiasm for the new wave of worker militancy might have led her to underestimate the strength of the status quo. At the turn of the century... Social Democratic Party membership was surging, but its affiliated unions were growing at an even faster clip. It was among organized labor that Bernstein's ideas found warm welcome. Fueled by a booming economy, the unions evolved from fringe, radical bodies to the mass guarantors of economic security. They organized 1.7 million workers by 1906, while the party itself could only boast 400,000 members. Unions won tangible gains for their membership not by following the SPD's tack of pure opposition, but by negotiating with employers. Labor wrestled concessions by threatening to disrupt production if demands were not met, but the logic of capitalism sets limits on the nature and extent of those demands— Workers need their firms to be profitable to stay employed, which tempers wage demands. And though capitalists need workers in order to stay in business, the relationship between the two sides is asymmetrical, as the unemployed stood ready to fill in for unruly workers. Achieving real gains, then, required both steady offensives and also the shrewdness to know when to retreat— it was an environment that fostered moderation, not revolution. The stakes involved in this balancing act were high, and many in the union movement came to resent the more symbolic political demands of social democracy. For example, 30,000 workers were locked out by their employers in 1906 after observing the traditional May Day strike. Such provocative political actions threatened to deplete union funds needed for economic strikes and to open the way for a broader employer counteroffensive. Divisions emerged between the more moderate trade union members and the more ideological SPD general membership, but unions were themselves increasingly dominated by a conservative leadership. Growing trade union membership meant more staff to manage their affairs. This was no doubt necessary, but it created a bureaucratic layer of people who worked in the name of the working class, but were increasingly alienated from its day-to-day -day experience. The mass strike debate in particular was a persistent headache for the trade unions. The challenge, after all, wasn't just from radical intellectuals, but from some rank-and-file unionists, such as the Ruhr Basin's coal miners. The union leaders decided to deal with the problem preemptively. At the Cologne Labor Conference in May 1905, Theodor Bummelburg, head of the Masons' Union, denounced the literati and its radical pretenses, and organized opposition to the mass strike tactic. 
It was an effort to inoculate the unions against the results of the SPD's coming Yena conference, in which debates about the mass strike would loom large. The unions not only rejected the tactic, but forbade discussion of it. Delegates insisted on peace in the labor movement to allow for unions to consolidate and grow. Their reply to outraged leftists would soon become familiar. Go back to Russia. Just a few months later, however, at the Yena conference, the mass strike was endorsed by the party as a legitimate tactic, though with plenty of qualifications. It was a tension typical of the time. The general membership would push through radical measures, trade unions would either defeat or neuter those measures, and the executive would engage in rhetorical gymnastics to appease all sides. But the sides were not of equal strength. The party leadership, though in theory disputing the revisionism that much of the union bureaucracy endorsed, in practice came to side with them. Crucially, in 1906, trade unions were granted veto power if the party wanted to declare a general strike, and they disagreed. Even if they had reservations, the SPD's leadership reasoned that the growing power of allied unions meant that they had to be placated for the sake of unity. If they had any doubts about this course, figures like Babel could look to the negative example of Britain, where the Marxists of the Social Democratic Federation were a marginal, isolated group, while a non-Marxist, reformist Labour Party enjoyed mass support. While revisionists were challenging the revolutionary goals of the Erfurt program, the radicals were seeking new tactics to make those goals a reality. All the while, the SPD executive struggled to preserve Erfurt's hard-won merger of the workers' and socialist movements. Yet its institutional needs would lead it to develop its own conservatizing bureaucracy. As it turned out, in a case study of the fragility of building a socialist movement within capitalism, the center would not hold. Friedrich Ebert arrived at the Social Democratic Party's Berlin office right after New Year's 1906 to find it in chaos. Record-keeping was abysmal, and the party was failing to collect desperately needed dues. To the outside world, the SPD was already without rival, the first mass party, but internally it was as if nothing had changed from the lean years underground. Ebert was just the man to turn things around. He wasn't a sterling orator or thinker, nor was he much to look at. One writer was kind enough to describe him as a short, fat man with short legs, a short neck, and a pear-shaped head on a pear-shaped body. But Ebert was disciplined and systematic and quickly set about renovating the party's operations. He had been waiting for this opportunity for some time, the son of a tailor, Ebert was attracted to social democracy early in life, but he never joined its most radical wing. After struggling to survive as an artisan saddle-maker, like Babel, he found material security through his political work. His administrative talents became apparent during his time as a member of Bremen's city council and as its local SPD labor secretary. It was a surprise, but no great one, when he was selected to join the party executive in 1905. Despite its explosive growth, the SPD had retained the structure it had adopted at Gotha in 1875. A five-member executive, expanded to seven in 1900, was tasked with managing day-to-day -day business, drafting the party congress agenda, and carrying out its decisions. This body's work was overseen by a small control commission, while the leadership's links to branches throughout the country were maintained by volunteer liaisons elected out of locals. Combined with a handful of editors and staff from the party press, the central office only encompassed a few dozen people. The SPD was highly fragmented, reflecting both the composition of the German state and the legacy of anti-SPD legislation, and dependent on its volunteers. The pressure to change came initially from the radicals, 
Some local branches, like those in Bavaria and Baden, pushed for reformist politics that better matched conditions in areas where smaller-scale industry prevailed and agriculture was still dominant. The radicals, feeling confident after the 1905 Jena Congress, saw centralization as a way to discipline these regional tendencies and create a more coherent revolutionary organization. The idea was a mirror image of what trade union leaders were trying to do. As in the unions, the SPD's bureaucracy emerged mainly out of necessity. Throughout the 1890s, as the party grew, its structure became more complex. District and state party organs were added to the existing local ones. The central organization's tiny staff was meant to coordinate a half million members and support hundreds of electoral races. All wings of the SPD whether they favored centralism or federalism, recognized the need for a larger bureaucracy. After years of delay, in 1905 the party eventually added more paid secretaries to its executive. The number of political officials was capped at four, two chairs elected by the party congress and two members selected by the control commission, but the number of secretaries was left open. Ebert was the first elected secretary, and he used his newly created secretary-general position to revamp the party's office. He updated administrative protocols and introduced typewriters and filing cabinets. Records that were never kept, lest they fall into state agent hands, were now harnessed. Ebert's goals were to increase membership dues, expand the party press, develop its electoral machine, and vitally, generate data with which to evaluate progress toward these objectives. Local volunteers were overwhelmed with questionnaires the new infrastructure sent them. They naturally deferred more and more to the growing network of paid professionals. Ebert fulfilled his administrative mandate exceptionally, but his role was far from apolitical. His efforts brought him into contact with all of the party's local officials. While Kautsky thought in terms of epochs and continents, Ebert worked toward immediate solutions. He wasn't a revolutionary, but neither was the daily work of the party. He can hardly be faulted for building an administrative machine and targeting wavering voters from other parties. Even if he hadn't spent a decade as a moderate in Bremen, this work would have pushed Ebert into a tactical alliance with reformists. Babel and other formerly radical members of the executive had met the same fate. For their part, Luxembourg and the other SPD radicals operated under the mistaken assumption that reformist party leaders would be forced out when a major political or economic crisis came. The radicals were right about one thing. A more sophisticated bureaucracy could have both improved the SPD's efficacy and supported rank-and-file militancy. Member engagement, greater oversight, term limits for secretaries, or any number of reforms could have checked any conservatizing tendencies. In the absence of these measures, however, the fact that the bureaucracy grew at a time when the trade union leadership and other dynamics were pushing the SPD rightward all but guaranteed the victory of more conservative forces. Social democratic workers were isolated from the rest of German society. This was a major reason they flocked to the SPD with its clubs and welfare programs in the first place. They were poorly educated, they lived in cramped, dirty housing, and their bodies were warped by overwork and fatigue. They were distinct, too, in their views on war. Other Germans cheered the patriotic cause during the 1870-1871 Franco-Prussian War. The working-class parties and trade unions opposed it. The society that had given them so little would get not one man, not one penny. In the early days, the SPD was split, with the Lasallians more accommodating of the national interest. But throughout the 1890s, the party was the Reich's only significant anti-militarist force, seeing the army as the tool of a rival class rather than of the nation as a whole. 
If there was any doubt, they could look at the institution's structure, generaled by Junkers, overseen by bourgeois officers, but manned by workers. It had the same class structure as the rest of Germany. In place of the old Prussian military system, the SPD proposed a citizen's militia. The Erfurt program's demands go far beyond those found in democratic republics. Education of all to bear arms, militia in the place of the standing army, determination by the popular assembly on questions of war and peace, settlement of all international disputes by arbitration. In practice, support for a militia system was justified on economic grounds more often than on moral ones. The Social Democrats used the issue to appeal to the popular classes, who disproportionately footed the bill for the military through indirect taxes. In this way, the fight against the Junker-controlled army and navy were tied to the struggle for fiscal reform. The approach made tactical sense, as taxation was one of the few areas the Reichstag had discretion over— but hardly challenged the moral right of a ruler to plunge a nation into war. As internationalists, socialists believe that workers across nations share more with one another than with elites who speak the same language as they do. In practice, many social democrats opposed an autocratic form of militarism but failed to present a radical alternative to the rotten system itself. Electoral considerations also forced the party into a balancing act that saw it talk of internationalism, yet still make clear a concern about national defense. This would pose a problem when World War I broke out and all belligerents claimed to be fighting a defensive war. Karl Liebknecht was among the most striking figures trying to push the party in a more radical direction when it came to questions of war and nationalism. Despite the fact that he was the son of an SPD founder, he was a persistent foe of the leadership. An impatient man, guided by his morals above all else, Liebknecht saw the question of war and militarism as the central issue of the time— arguing that peace was only possible if the whole military machine was abolished. He pushed for revolutionary agitation among German military recruits. For the SPD's leadership, such provocations were a danger to the party's steady advance, an advance that would yield many of the transformations radicals like Liebknecht desired anyway. Tensions arose at the Second International's Stuttgart Congress in 1907, in the prior decade, German naval expansion and the two Morocco crises, in 1905 to 1906 and 1911, had made continental war a real possibility. Over days of debate, SPD delegates were pushed by British and French socialists to adopt an explicitly anti-war stance. Earlier, many radicals in the SPD had avoided such a resolution thinking it naive that social democracy could mobilize to prevent war between capitalist states rather than just responding to a war with socialist revolution. But now they adopted the stance of Liebknecht and Kurt Eisner, who had long sought a more proactive approach. From the party's right wing, they were challenged by those like Gustav Noske, who had insisted in Parliament that social democrats weren't vagabonds without a fatherland, but Germans. Though Noska's rhetoric was an extreme example, most of the German delegation opposed the radicals. Half of them came from the more conservative trade union movement, and many of the remainder were revisionists. They stressed the limited power of the international in domestic affairs and tried to prevent any resolution favoring the mass strike as a weapon to prevent war. Despite German resistance, however, the Stuttgart Congress took a clear anti-war stance, with the caveat that the international is not able to determine in rigid forms the anti-militarist actions of the working class which are naturally different in different countries. The hesitancy on the part of the German delegation was not just ideological— the federal election earlier that year had been a disaster for the SPD, 
Their vote share only declined 2.7 percent, but the party lost nearly half its Reichstag seats. The election was seen as a referendum on empire, and the Social Democrats as the sole opposition to the prevailing imperial foreign policy were vulnerable. The poor result took on a magnified role because so much of the party's legitimacy was wrapped up with it moving from strength to strength in its apparent unstoppable march toward power. How to proceed next was the question. For radicals, there was no need to break with the strategy of pure opposition to bourgeois society. Kautsky thought the 1907 election was proof that the class struggle was sharpening and that the middle class were unstable allies. Mistakes had been made, but they were tactical rather than strategic in nature. To the revisionists, however, the setback was caused by excessive radicalism in all spheres. The working-class vote was intact, but middle-class, progressive voters who had supported the party in 1903 had jumped ship. Throughout 1907, even Babel felt the need to join Noska in assuring bourgeois critics that the party was not anti-national. The Stuttgart Congress had the potential to undo this work. What made the situation in 1907 especially difficult was the fact that the tactics of the SPD had found imitators on the right. New membership organizations won support for imperialism, as a more populist German nationalism competed with social democracy for the allegiance of workers. The SPD was largely anti-colonial, another of its unique features in the pre-war German landscape. The bloody atrocities during the German conquests of its African territories and New Guinea, and later the suppressing of the Herero, 1904-1908, and Maji Maji rebellions, 1905 to 1907, were condemned by the party. It is true that Bernstein, editor Josef Bloch, economist Max Schippel, and a host of other prominent revisionists came to support imperialism, often adopting the idea of a civilizing mission popular at the time. But mainstream SPD opinion on the matter was closer to Luxembourg's staunch anti-colonialism and that's how contemporaries perceived the party. Domestic politics was still the main source of division within the SPD. In the aftermath of the 1907 election, Kautsky staked out consistently radical positions, but he became even more acutely aware of the dangers of a split in the party. By 1910, he began defending the Erfurtian synthesis from challengers on both his left and his right flanks, Luxembourg and like-minded activists on the left had a more active conception of what it would take to win power, that is, through the instigation of class struggle, especially through mass strikes, even if it resulted in short-term defeat. Class consciousness was forged and cemented, after all, through action. Kautsky, wary of what failure could bring, thought time was working in social democracy's favor and wanted to postpone the final conflict until victory was certain. His views then were still distinct from the revisionists, who didn't see a need for that conflict, but he moved closer to them on certain parliamentary questions. Whereas, after 1907, Kautsky defended the party's radical isolation— after the 1912 elections, he saw potential to work with liberals in the Reichstag. Still believing himself the defender of orthodox Marxism, he moved more to the center within the SPD. He would tactically reunite with the left off and on over the next decade, during which the party would fracture and fail. It is remarkable, in retrospect, how consistently anti-war the SPD majority was before World War I. For decades, German Social Democrats risked much for opposing the state and its military. Babel and the elder Liebknecht faced trial for high treason in 1872. Karl Liebknecht was imprisoned for anti-war writings in 1907. Luxembourg was arraigned in 1914. SPD Reichstag deputies, immune from prosecution, 
were a reliable source of dissent in a political system lacking it. Far from moving away from these commitments, as war approached, the party embraced an even more strident anti-war spirit. In late 1912, responding to the Balkan War, simultaneous rallies were held in Berlin, London, and Paris. In a dramatic display of internationalism, French socialist Jean Jaurès visited Berlin to speak against the war in German, while German and British leaders went to London and Paris, respectively. The anti-war demonstrations were the largest ever held by the SPD and took place without support from liberal parties. The manifesto from the international conference that followed foresaw the Great War's devastation. The proletariat is conscious of being at this moment the bearer of the entire future of humankind. Its message seemed resolute. To the capitalist world of exploitation and mass murder, oppose in this way the proletarian world of peace and fraternity of peoples. But still, in December 1912, the SPD and its counterparts elsewhere in Europe showed that they hadn't completely abandoned the language of national defense. In the Reichstag, Georg Ledebour and Eduard David, though from opposite wings of the party, both insisted that Germany ought not to uphold its military obligations to Austria-Hungary if it invaded Serbia. They did this, however, while supporting the idea of a defensive alliance with Austria-Hungary against Russia. The principles that would dictate the 1914 war debate were set. Mass demonstrations would prevent war, if that failed, the SPD would decide its course based on nature of the conflict. Some social democrats may have predicted that millions would be killed in a continental war, but many German elites saw in a war the chance for quick gains at the expense of their rivals, at home and abroad. Between the Austrian ultimatum to Serbia on July 23, 1914, and the Reichstag war credit vote on August 4, the ruling class decided on war. The working class movement's position was less clear. The SPD held to its preventive strategy, with the party initially demanding, as it had in 1912, that the German state restrain Austria and negotiate for peace. Tens of thousands met the call for demonstrations, singing the Internationale and proclaiming the unity of all workers— but it was a smaller showing than during the earlier Balkan crisis. The people, like the party, were unprepared for how quickly events would move. On July 30th, the day before Russia mobilized for war, the SPD sent members of its senior leadership to Switzerland with the party treasury. They were prepared for severe repression if war broke out. Perhaps some knew of Engels's 1889 warning that war would entail unparalleled devastation and the compulsory and universal suppression of our movement. Amid a nationalist upsurge, he predicted that the movement would be overwhelmed, crushed, stamped out by violence. Like Kautsky, Engels saw peace as leading to almost certain victory for socialism— but what were his disciples to do when war was inevitable? When the moment came, they capitulated, fearful of the violent destruction of what they had spent four decades building. Babel spared his legacy by dying in 1913, but the rest of the leadership was not so lucky. There was dispute over where the party should stand. The fact that Austria was the aggressor seemed to support Chairman Ugo Haza and others who said it was social democratic policy to oppose war in such a situation, but Ebert could just as compellingly point to Russian mobilization as a threat. The party ended up accepting Wilhelm II's claims that German overtures for peace were being rebuffed by Tsar Nicholas II and acted on that basis. 78 out of 92 SPD parliamentarians supported war credits, a decision mirrored by Social Democrats in other belligerent countries. A minority opposed to the stance led by Liebknecht and Haza nevertheless held to parliamentary norms and voted in bloc with the majority, 
no doubt confusing the party rank and file about the extent of division within the delegation. As the Kaiser proclaimed, I no longer know parties, I only know Germans. Some SPD members saw an opportunity. The faction around Ludwig Frank explicitly viewed the conflict as a chance to extract democratic reform. As they put it, we will win suffrage in Prussia by waging a war instead of a general strike. But most of the SPD struck a more conflicted tone, hoping for a rapid peace, but asserting that the war was one of self-defense, not conquest. Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky captured the mood of social democracy's left, describing August 4th, 1914, as one of the most tragic days of his life. The decision of the SPD and other social democratic parties to support war was not predestined. What was unavoidable was the tensions involved in building a mass party opposed to capitalism while operating within capitalism. Workers wanted more than pure opposition. They wanted concrete victories, or else they could lose faith in politics. They also needed to build more professional organizations to represent their interests. But in doing so, a conservative union and party bureaucracy arose that had little interest in opposing an initially popular war or following through on the party's stated goals. It turned out that the revolution wasn't going to make itself, and the majority, many rank-and-file workers included, weren't going to risk everything they had already won to make it. This is not to say that a different approach was not possible. Institutional measures could have been taken to make the party bureaucracy more democratic and accountable. The trade unions should have perceived the way in which their economic gains would be undermined without radical political reform. The SPD built a strong army, drilled its troops, but waited for its opponent to collapse rather than pressing the offensive. As the Great War dragged on and its horrific nature became clear, more and more Social Democrats opposed it. But it wasn't until March 1916 that a significant number under Haas's leadership formed a Social Democratic working group within the party. It would be another year before the decisive break that saw the creation of an independent Social Democratic Party, USPD, which united leftists and centrists, and even those revisionists like Bernstein who opposed the war. The war brought domestic repression and the arrest of leading radicals, making political organizing difficult. Unable to match the size and strength of the SPD, the USPD could do little to end a war that killed millions. The USPD was itself divided. Most of the party didn't pursue the policy of Lenin's Bolsheviks, who saw the conflict as a reason and a means to agitate for the ruin of all belligerent armies and for worker revolution. Instead, Kautsky and others simply fought for peace. Luxembourg and Liebknecht, for their part, formed the Spartacus League as a faction within the USPD with a more radical outlook. Later, they founded the Communist Party of Germany, KPD. But their effectiveness was limited. When a radical surge took place, as when sailors revolted in Wilhelmshaven and Kiel in 1918, or when Soviets emerged throughout Germany, a Soviet republic was even proclaimed in Bavaria. They never were able to shape developments as ably as their Bolshevik counterparts in Russia. During the German Revolution that followed the nation's defeat in the First World War, the Spartacists faced a question. Bourgeois democracy or socialist democracy? They were unable to force their preferred answer— through decisive and cruel measures, including unleashing right-wing paramilitaries on their former comrades who murdered Luxembourg, Liebknecht, and scores of others, the Social Democratic Party took power and created a democratic republic, a bourgeois democracy. Friedrich Ebert held office until his death in 1925, but despite his best efforts, the Weimar Republic would become synonymous with failure. Like the future communist workers' state to its east, 
the Social Democratic Workers' State came to be resented by millions of workers. The SPD only held power briefly in the 1920s, attempting mostly to secure the support of other parties for the Young Republic. Even that was far too radical a course for Noska, who broke ranks and backed the conservative war hero Paul von Hindenburg in 1925 and 1932. Under siege from both left and right, Weimar fell to the horrors of Nazism. After the Second World War, European Social Democrats, led by the heirs to Eduard Bernstein, developed what they couldn't after the first, a program to successfully govern the capitalist state. At the same time, Soviet-style socialism came to East Germany from above, with the martyred radical Democrats Luxembourg and Liebknecht used as icons of an authoritarian order. In its most formative period, isolated in the harsh conditions of Russia, socialism became synonymous with a bloodied collectivism.